Hello and welcome to the 2022 Tee Up for Teaching seminar. My name is Dana Dempsey and I'm the Director of Therapeutic Recreation here at Scottish Rite. This is our fourth session and it's regarding disabilities and teaching individuals who have a disability. So how disabilities can affect a golfer's functioning level and then once you understand that, how do we teach? Many of you are already golf instructors, and many of you are already therapists working with individuals who have a disability. The intention of this session is not to try to turn a golf instructor into a therapist or a therapist into a golf instructor, but rather I want to talk about things that uh, we have experienced over the years, actually over the past 20 plus years of our Learn to Golf program, and many of the things that have come to light, things that I've observed directly and things that I've learned over the years, hoping that it will help uh, you as you move forward in working with individuals who have a disability, either to help teach them golf, use golf as part of your rehabilitation tools, or helping to just improve the person's life. So, Many times when we think about disabilities, there are diagnostic groupings. Um, so as you see on the screen, different medical conditions and they all have an alphabet soup. So uh, instead of just going according to their initials, um, I thought it would be more helpful to actually spell some of them out. So autism spectrum disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, developmental delays or intellectual developmental delays, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, visual impairments, strokes. Oftentimes what we see is attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorders. There is a wide range of disabilities and chronic medical conditions. And now with the internet, it's pretty easy to Google a particular condition and get an understanding, a baseline understanding of what it means. What does that condition mean? Um, so while it's helpful to understand some of the words, I think it's more helpful to understand maybe how a medical condition can affect a person's functioning and how that ties into golf. You know, the column on the right over the years really reflects um, our children here at Scottish Rite who've been involved in the Learn to Golf program. You'll see that the highest number of children have cerebral palsy. Um, and we can go down the list, the, the different hand differences, children with arthritis, uh, muscular dystrophy, scoliosis. Um, and so keeping that in mind, again, I think it's helpful to understand how that medical condition affects a person's body and affects their functioning. But yet, when a child or an adult comes to you as a golf instructor or comes to a facility, uh, they don't wear a label. They don't have a tag that says, I'm a person with spina bifida, or I'm a person with Marfan syndrome. I didn't put that on the list. Or I'm a person with cerebral palsy. Uh, usually if someone is missing limbs, that's clearly evident. Uh, if someone has weakness on one side, oftentimes that's evident too. So by looking at pictures, these are all pictures from some of, of our Learn to Golf clinics and some of our kids who have participated in them. Some of the children, by looking at them, there's a visible difference. There's a visible impairment. But some of the kids looking at them, it's not so visible. So regardless, I think it's helpful for you as instructors uh, and therapists who are working with your clients to take a look at what is affected, how their functioning is affected. 
Um, I actually, the next probably four slides, I've borrowed from a colleague, Dr. Amanda Clue. You heard from her during the first session from the um, National Inclusion Project. She's letting me use these slides because it does a nice job of outlining individuals with autism and neurodiversity. What are some of the considerations when working with an individual that has autism or is a neurodiverse individual? And what are some of their needs? So that when you think about working with them, what are some strategies that you may use to make their experience more successful? So individuals with autism, they do, like many, have a wide range of individual skills and characteristics. And I would be remiss if I didn't say at this point, if you know one person with autism, well, you know one person with autism. Or if you know one person with an amputation, you only know one person with an amputation. You cannot necessarily generalize and think just because, oh, I know someone with X, Y, Z. That doesn't mean that those characteristics that that one person has is going to carry over and be true for the next person with that same medical condition or the next person with that same medical condition because we are all unique individuals and how various medical conditions affect us, even sometimes the same medical condition can affect us in very different ways. So individuals with autism often experience delays or either delays in obtaining um, language skills or they may have uneven language skills. Oftentimes, individuals with autism have difficulty in social settings. They have uh, difficulty with social skills, and therefore it makes it hard to be around others, to be successful in social settings. Many times individuals with autism, they have an uneven pattern of cognition, meaning how to process information, how to learn, uh, even uneven patterns in their intellectual abilities. They may be really strong at one skill, let's say math, but yet science or languages, they are very slow in their math. It's really very different for each person. Oftentimes they experience what are referred to as sensory sensitivities, meaning that a person may become overwhelmed with too much sound or too many people around, too much stimulation, visual stimulation. And so many times some of these difficulties that, that they have, they may be exhibited in behavioral struggles. You know, someone from the outside may look and just think, oh, that child is behaving badly when it's not about behaving badly, it's about being overwhelmed and not knowing how to cope with the issues that they have, with the limitations that they have. So as a person working with them, it's maybe helpful to make sure that you have structured, organized lessons, make sure there's predictability, have things be sequential, break tasks down into segmented parts and pieces that build upon one another. And it may take a little longer for the individual to learn, but it gives a consistent way in which they can learn and a consistent way in which the information is presented to them. Make sure that there are intentional opportunities that you model social behaviors, but that you also provide opportunities for the, the learner to have social interactions, not only with you, but with others too, and have the opportunity to develop friendships. Again, modeling and flexibility, modeling ways to express one's feelings, 
modeling the opportunity or modeling really the way that one might imagine or pretend. So these are some ways in which you can work with an individual that that helps. Some of their strengths is that again they have a wide a wide range of skills and abilities. Oftentimes individuals with autism or neurodiversity they can be really good at memorizing information quickly. Oftentimes they excel in visual thinking, being able to see something and remember it, or being able to see something and learn from it. Therefore, it would be helpful for us to use visual learning as part of the way to introduce concepts to them. Going back to some other needs and strategies, options for making connections and attention, using some assistive technology. Um, it may be that there is um, computers to be able to use videoing, the, uh, videoing of a swing or of what you're wanting to have happen. So, it's helpful to be able to use a variety of techniques when working with individuals who have autism or who are neurodiverse. Now, for individuals with intellectual disabilities, they may struggle more with memory, cognition, processing, being able to remember how something is done or remember information that you gave them. Again, it's not that these individuals are not able to learn. Sometimes it just takes longer for them to learn. So what might be some beneficial strategies? Once again, predictability, structure, and organization. And quite honestly, I think we all enjoy a little bit of predictability structure and organization. The less chaotic things are, the better. So when an individual who has intellectual impairments or disabilities goes into a lesson, then having a pattern, a certain way of approaching learning every day when we first meet, we're going to you know, say hello, we're going to get out, let's say our putter to start with, and we're going to always go to the putting area. After that, we'll always go to the chipping area. Something that is structured and organized, something that is sequential. So you will see that many of the things that work for individuals that have autism or are neurodiverse also are many of the same strategies that you use for intellectual individuals with intellectual disabilities. Oftentimes these individuals also, it's helpful to have, ex well, when they say support for extended attention, oftentimes attention spans may be slow. So instead of expecting someone to stand there for a full five or 10 minutes while you try to verbally explain something, break it up into smaller segments, a two minute segment, so that you can slowly build up to that five minutes. But at first, it's only, you're only asking for attention of a minute or maybe attention for 30 seconds. As you get to know the individual you're working with, you will better understand what their baseline is and where you're starting at and where you can take them, where you can go to and build upon that. So just like fine and gross motor skills, all of these things are meant to build upon one another. So it's important to realize that you're going to want to help these individuals have building blocks for learning. When we take a look at the physical side, 
whether it's a golfer with muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy or CP, maybe arthritis or some other rheumatic disease or spinal cord injury. All of these can cause decreased strength, decreased endurance. So in some ways, while it's helpful to know that someone with cerebral palsy may have decreased strength, when somebody comes to you, it, it's not so much what it is that caused the decreased strength. I think what can be more helpful, and this is what instructors have told me over the years, it's more helpful to know what I need to do with that individual. What are some strategies or things that I can use to compensate for their decreased strength and endurance? So some strategies such as using equipment that's easier to handle. Maybe, for example, if they have decreased strength and they're not swinging as hard, so therefore the, the club's head speed is slower, maybe clubs with more loft or maybe clubs that have more flexibility or something that's lightweight. You know, if you have trouble bringing back the club to swing because of the weight, well, then get a lighter club so that you can, in fact, control. We talk about temperature regulation and why that's important for decreased strength and endurance is because if a person is unable to regulate their own temperature, meaning let's say if I'm an individual with a spinal cord injury and my body does not regulate my temperature, meaning I overheat, that is going to make me even more tired. So what type of things can I do to help adjust my body temperature or recognize that maybe I need to be out of the sun more or maybe I have shorter periods of exertion? So things like that are helpful to know that you can adjust when you're working with the individual. Contractures or spasms. Sometimes as people get individually um, Sometimes as people get more um, tired, they've exerted more effort, muscles get tired. Sometimes you will see spasms. You will see uh, uh, where there is less, oh, I guess the, I would say you see less effectiveness in that muscle. But then sometimes because of contractures where let's say you have a contracture in a joint like an elbow joint or a knee joint um, where it's in a fixed position, that is going to make it difficult for the person to move, not only to, to walk uh, or to stand uh, or to swing a club, but that also means that they are having to exert more energy to try to swing that club or to try to stand or to walk. And so because of contractures or spasms, that can cause a person to burn a lot more energy. And once again, you may need to think about having shorter periods of time where they're having to expend energy. So different things can cause decreased strength, decreased endurance. And so you want to consider what can we do given the amount of strength or given the amount of endurance, perseverance that the individual is able to exert can only go so far before their body just, it's too much. So there are things also like course strategy that can help compensate for lack of strength or endurance. Um, so play smarter, not harder. Individuals who have limited movement. And what I mean by limited movement is instead of being able to, let's say, bring your arm all the way up over your head, maybe they're only able to bring their arm up to a shoulder height. Um, maybe limited movement means they can't turn their shoulders as far as what one would like during a swing. Maybe there is the limited motion or limited movement in any joint, in any um, 
type of movement that they're trying to make those joints, those muscles do. So again, lightweight equipment. Um, you mentioned grip size. You might think about, well, why grip size? Why does that help with limited movement? For individuals, and I see this more with individuals with cerebral palsy and arthritis, especially if it affects their hands, that trying to grip on a club with a more narrow grip is very difficult. So by building up the grip size, that allows them to hold on to the club in a more comfortable and a more controlled way. So taking a look again at the shafts with flexibility on the club, um, a torsion adapter is a, a, a device that's actually used on a prosthetic limb that allows for twisting and turning. Um, so if you're working with an individual who has a lower extremity amputation and they're having trouble turning, maybe it's appropriate for them to talk with their prosthetist. Let the prosthetist know that they are wanting to play golf and they're having trouble turning as their golf instructor would like them to turn. So while the golf instructors don't need to become prosthetists, it is helpful to be aware that there are components that can be put on a prosthetic device that may aid in that turning. Again, with the uh, hydration, uh, the wearing time for an individual who has a prosthesis, um, with that limited movement, Oftentimes, when an individual that's using a lower extremity prosthesis and their, their, their residual limb is in that socket, they're moving within that socket. The, honestly, the goal is to not try to have that limb move within the socket because of how that can cause uh, pressure sores, it can wear on the skin. So recognizing that the amount of time that a person has their prosthesis on can affect their ability not only to move, but it also can affect their endurance um, as well. When we come to balance issues, there are a lot of things that address balance issues. Um, and so we will take a look at individuals who have amputations and how that balance can affect. Or what about those individuals that wear braces? And what I'm specifically referring to on the braces are what are called AFOs, or ankle foot orthoses. Those are the braces that uh, you will see people have that come to the back of their calf, around the back of their heel, and uh, underneath their foot. And that helps to prevent their foot from dropping. It helps to hold the foot in the proper position so that as they walk, they're not tripping and falling. So with these AFOs, imagine, and maybe some of you have walked in snow ski boots before. You know, your feet are in uh, a position that's rather awkward to walk in because it does not allow for your ankle and your feet to flex and move with your usual walk. Well, that's the same thing with the AFOs. For the most part, they do have AFOs that have hinges, but for this purpose, we're going to say that it's a fixed AFO because it too can cause balance issues as you're learning to walk in those, but then as you're learning to swing. What about golfers with limb differences? Imagine what it would be if you had anywhere from a half inch to an inch or more of a difference between one leg or the other. So you're standing at a different level position. So moving then really can make a difference. Same thing when individuals are seated in a wheelchair. It doesn't really matter whether a person is standing or seated, there can still be balance issues. For those individuals who uh, play from a wheelchair or a seated position, the type of trunk control or how much trunk control they have really can make a difference with how much um, balance they have. For individuals who have a spinal cord injury that's high up on their spine, 
then they don't have the muscle control of their torso to be able to help hold them in place. And that's why oftentimes individuals who have a high injury on their spinal cord, they have to use their arms to push them back up in place, or they'll need to hold on to something to support them while they have one-handed swing. So these are all different things to be aware of for balance issues. With traumatic brain injury or stroke, those portions of the brain that do help control our balance as we stand or as we walk or as we move in space, those may be affected. So rather than expecting an instructor or even a therapist to know exactly how that is going to affect the person, we don't necessarily know because it affects everybody differently. So you need to be able to observe, be able to communicate and talk with that golf student, with that customer, that client, that patient, so that you understand that the movements that you're asking them to make, how does that feel for them? How does that affect them? Where are they um, uncomfortable? Where do they not feel balanced or settled? When we look at approaches to teaching, uh, according to Sports and Recreation for the Disabled, in most cases, the medium or the, the method for involving individuals with disabilities is not about equipment so much as it is about the proper instruction by an experienced golf instructor. Now, whether it's golf or not, go back and think about in school, when you were in school and you had teachers. I'm sure you can think back about some teachers that really helped you love the subject. You loved learning. You enjoyed being around them. They made learning fun and they helped you feel more confident as you were learning. The same is true with golf instructors. The same is true with therapists working with individuals in a healthcare setting. How you approach teaching, how you approach interacting with the individual makes all the dis di difference in the world, really. I like this quote by Ernest Jones. The trouble with teaching golf is that one is taught what a swing produces instead of how to produce a swing. There's a difference between focusing on body movement and focusing on club movement, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I mentioned before about how it's important to do observation, to observe, understand, and we all know this in our head. No two golfers are the same. They have different strengths. They are different size, shapes, athletic abilities. And yet, sometimes I have observed instructors try to teach different children the very same way, as if they are carbon copies of one another and they're not carbon copies. Each person's swing is going to be a little different. Their stance is going to be a little bit different. But regardless, you can still teach the person to swing the club effectively. And this isn't a new concept. Even back with Ernest Jones, and more recently, although he too has passed, Manuel De La Torre, who was an outstanding instructor, he knew the importance of swing the club head instruction, not trying to make your body move in just a certain way. So, if we have a club focused instruction where it's an external focus, and for those of you who would like to read the uh, research paper that was done, it's cited below. An external focus of attention enhances golf shot accuracy in beginners and experts. Basically, what it was confirming was that having an external focus, knowing how to move the club, that was much more effective in making improvements than trying to have 
an internal focus or a body focus because swinging motion of the club really is universal. We may look differently as we swing the club, but the swing of the club is universal. Here are a couple of fo uh, photos. Uh, Mr. Gary Pickle. Um, he is teaching one of our learn to golf kids um, how to do a one arm swing. This young uh, golf student for a long time was so focused on trying to keep both hands on the club and swing with both hands. Eventually, Gary was able to get him to really be open to trying a one arm swing. His range of motion improved. He got uh, a lot better swing as a result because of effect, his affected arm wasn't trying to maintain contact with the club. And it ended up being a better swing of the club and a better shot as a result. The body focused approach to instruction teaches that you need to control how your body moves. And quite honestly, it tries to focus on way too much. It's amazing how within just a split second, our mind can go in a dozen different directions. Oh, I got to focus on my balance, my tempo. Right? How do I breathe? Is my arm in the right place? Are my hands back right? So instead of getting all that and trying to focus on all of that, Focus in on the club because a body focus type of instruction. It demands that the body parts all have to do in a correct order, in a correct sequence, in the correct position. It's asking the golfer to address too many things. I love the picture on the left. Uh, first time I saw it, I, I couldn't help but think, oh my God, that's me because for a long time, I myself was very focused on body focus instruction until I had some golf instructors that used a club focused form of teaching and it helped so much. I'm so grateful. So approaches to teaching not only are more effective if you have a club focus approach, it's also about relational teaching or relational coaching. I love this photo. Daryl Chase, who uh, used to work out at um, Oakhurst in Bullard, Texas. This is him with a couple of our Learn to Golf golfers. He is probably one of the best golf instructors I have seen that really show the, the caring, the concern. He listens well to the kids. Um, he just makes learning golf fun. And it is fun to watch him with the kids, to see how they interact, to see how they're excited. So what he is able to do and what many golf instructors we've worked with over the years are able to do is to step outside of the box of necessarily how they've always been introduced to golf or how they have typically taught in the past. Many I have seen shift their focus to what works best for this student. What approach can I use to help this student? And what is going to help at this moment? Because even when you're working with the same golf student, it's a different time. It's a different day. Maybe one day the child had a tough day at school or the adult had a tough day at work or something else is on their mind. So be present in the moment with the golf student so that you can 
think about how can I be most effective with them at this moment? And how can I develop the relationship that is really going to help this person move forward? Bottom line is, it's really feeling good about yourself and your coach. These are photos from different golf clinics that we've held around the state. And I just love the joy on people's face. You know, these aren't staged photos. It's, it's about enjoying what you're doing, working with the student, working with the instructor. And many of you experience these types of, of events and experiences yourself when you teach. So don't get, don't get so worried about getting hung up about, oh, I'm going to be working with an individual who has a disability. Go out and have some fun. And you know how to teach golf. Do that. Work with them. Now, like I said, many of you already know how to coach and teach. And so this is for those of you who are new to teaching in group settings. And let me also, as a reminder for some of you who do teach in group settings, these are some, I would say, some things to be aware of that I've observed over the years of uh, watching different instructors in different groups. Um, some things that might help the group, the session, the lesson be even more successful. When I say instruct so the lowest level of performance can participate, yet highest level of performance is challenged, that is that balance. So that if I, as a golf student, come, instruct me at the level where I'm at, yet challenge me to try to improve. Because if I'm not challenged, I'm going to become bored. I'm going to be I'm going to lose interest in this. So beginning of each group, use your observational skills. As I've said before, really see your student. I think the example of this or lack of using observation skills happened during one of our clinics where we had a golf instructor working with about five of our younger students uh, in our learn to golf program. And that instructor spent probably almost 10 minutes trying to verbalize to the seven and eight year old kids how to hold the golf club. And he um, carefully showed, demonstrated how to hold the club. Yet, as I walked by and started to see what was happening, I don't think that the golf instructor noticed that out of the five children, three of them did not have two fully developed hands. One was missing a hand completely, and the other two did not have all their fingers on their hands, and so therefore their grip would not look like the instructor's grip. So make sure you use your observation skills and see your student. Consider using nonverbal approaches. Yes, explaining is great, but so is the demonstration. Um, using a nonverbal way to show is also very helpful. Sometimes it is a um, hand on hand approach. Kind of that I do, then we do, and then you do. I will show you, we may do this together for hand on hand, and then you do this on your own and show. It's helpful to try to focus on one task, one at a time, trying to simplify things. A previous golf instructor that I worked with for a number of years who has since passed, Mary Lou Crocker. I can remember her saying, toe up, toe up, three o'clock, nine o'clock. It's a half swing. And let's get some work done on a half swing 
before you tried to move further into a full swing. She also used drills such as tossing a ball underhanded um, or rolling a ball on the green to try to help demonstrate concepts and to explain what happens. Other approaches with group setting is to use a set amount of time for a particular one on one with each student and then allow yourself to move up and down the line so that you're spending a little bit of time with each student, then leave them with one thought to do. What are they to then practice as you go to the next student and then on to the next? After your initial one on one contact, then it makes it easier to teach the entire group, maybe from standing behind or off to the side or going back and forth between the group or into the individual. At our Learn to Golf clinics, I usually have volunteers that I call golf assistants, and I always tell them, you don't need to worry about whether or not you know how to play golf or, or how good you are. What you do need to do is to listen to what the golf instructor is telling the student and then parrot that back. Because as that golf professional goes up and down the line of working with the individual for a short period of time, giving them one swing task or swing thought, that volunteer hearing what the student is supposed to do can help to reinforce that and continue to work with that individual while the golf professional moves on to the next. This approach really allows you to spend more time and more equal time among the different students in the group. As I said before, these are just some basic pieces of information, some tips about how to improve teaching, ways to approach working with individuals who have a disability. So if you or when, really, because it's not a matter of if, it's when you work with an individual who has a disability, you will be able to use some of these techniques, hopefully, to have it be more successful. So this is now the time for the quiz. Please be sure to scan the QR code or click the link uh, and complete the quiz. Remember, if you're going to get continuing education credits, uh, the quiz must be completed. Um, I recognize that at the virtual, uh, during this virtual session, those of you who do not have the opportunity to also attend our hands-on portion, I think sometimes this is the toughest point or toughest part because you don't get the opportunity to then follow that up and, and actually practice some of the techniques that, that I talked about during this session. So I would encourage you that if you're watching this from another state, try to work with individuals, get connected with some of the organizations uh, in your area. Is there uh, an amputee golf association? Is there a program that already is geared towards working with individuals to have a disability. Go and volunteer your time so that you get some experience and feel more comfortable working with those individuals. That's why a hands-on portion is so important. But I do think it's helpful to understand some basic information and, and to have a foundational knowledge on which to then use and implement. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, if you have questions for me, please be sure to reach out and send me an email to dana.dempsey at tsrh.org, and I'll be happy to answer your questions either by email or we can have a phone call or a virtual uh, meeting. Thank you.